when you hold a weapon like that, you can feel it. You can feel the, the, the history, history, the way the history. You know, yeah. how many people touched this? Like, how much game was taken with that? This thing was just so devastating, man. Woo! I don't know what's going on with these. Like, weird that makes me things. happy. Like, don't get in front of him. <laughs> See how that's moving around there? That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I love. No, it's great it's animation. So What's up, Gameologists? Welcome back to another episode of Total Recoil, exploring weapons and equipment from some of your favorite video games. I'm Israel Wright, your host, former Green Beret, and with you once again, the fantabulous Paul Meixner. Good to see you, Paul. Hey, good to see you too, man, and good to see all of you. Uh, I love reading all the ridiculous comments you guys have, and the funnier the better. Uh, I'm a former U.S. Army infantryman that is now working as a weapons consultant and trainer, both in Hollywood and outside of the film industry. Today, we're gonna to be looking at some weapons and equipment from Call of Duty Vanguard. But before we do, I wanna tell you about a new channel from Gameology called Gameology Forecast. This is their new page for all things gaming, teaching you things you never thought you knew about the gaming world. Hey, you might learn a thing or two. You know, give, give, it a, give it a shot. Quit being so closed-minded, okay? Now it's gonna be jam-packed full of amazing content that you've never seen from Gameology before. Great stuff like tips, tricks, and hacks for that game that you've been struggling with. Your mom told me about it, she called me. So we're gonna help you out with that, okay? No, don't be embarrassed, it's fine. It's fine, everybody struggles sometimes. We're gonna have top 10 videos. We're gonna have discovery compilations with hidden gems, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna do reviews of newly released games and more. It mouth is gonna be dry, you need to drink some water. It's crazy. Hydrate, people, hydrate. Hydrate. Send noobs, getting your fill of virtually out of games and other free games that you should definitely check out. Gameology Shorts, which are, as the name might imply, short gaming videos that you're sure to enjoy. It's gonna be awesome. So you have potentially three new channels that you can check out after you watch this video. Please do so, we hope you enjoy them and uh, let us know in the comments section of what other kinds of content you'd like to see from us. Keep in mind, I'm not a World War II historian, I'm a weapons trainer, so I teach people how to fight with weapons. I do know a bit about the weapons that we're talking about, so I'm really excited. I'm also really excited to read all the comments on where I screw up or misspeak, and please, please let me have it, go for it. Actually, uh, I am a World War II historian, and I know everything <laughs> about World War II, so I'm gonna get everything perfectly accurate today. You know, it's gonna be wonderful. That's right. Super accurate. Well, that being said, folks, Paul, you ready to get into some Call of Duty Vanguard? You ready? I think yeah. you're ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, the Owen gun. The Owen, the Aussie submachine gun. Ooh, look at that. You know what? Right away, World War II, it looks like just like factory made, very few pieces, very simple design. Well, I mean, you got to think they had to equip a ton of people really quick. Right. People kind of fell into this. You know, there's limited money and you just need something that works. And also, submachine guns are kind of a new thing for World War II. I mean, it started to get developed right beforehand, but this is like the first huge large scale war where like, okay, yeah, like we really need this. This looks exactly like you said, it's, it's factory made. Stamped. I think this was the only submachine gun ever designed in Australia and then employed by Australia. Oh, they no usually kidding. use other people's weapons. Like, maybe I'm wrong about that, but they were using the Steyr Aug forever. Yeah, Let us know what uh, modern day special forces in Australia are using. Yeah, yeah. Can we in their SAS? Probably use whatever the heck they want. Do they call them SAS? It's something SAS. So it's it's a take off of the British SAS. Is this the one because I see the top loading magazine? Is this the one with kind of the off, side, off center sight? It is, but this one kind of looks opposite from what I know. There on the right side. The sights are on the right side of the gun. So this, it looks like they, for some reason, for gameplay, like reversed it. For the characters right-handed, I can see how they would be on the left-hand side. It, like, I would like them on the right-hand side because I'm left-handed. Well, you know? yeah, but when you line it up, when you line the gun up and the magazine's right here and your right eye is looking down it, they're actually off to the right in real life. They're you not off to the left. I think they changed it maybe for gameplay. Interesting. Yeah, I'm fairly certain, and correct me in the, in the comments if I'm wrong, but I'm oh, fairly you certain. Will. But it looks really good. Other than that, it looks like a mirror image of the actual Owen gun. Look at those Australian arms. Yeah. You see how it's it's not exactly the most accurate weapon. This is like close in fighting. You know, you're not taking a lot of distance shots with it. They just needed something that they could cheaply manufacture and equip right. as many soldiers as quickly as possible that was effective and reliable. Yeah, it, it is tripping me up. The sights, they look pretty accurate to me, except they're just on the opposite side. And I think maybe they did that for the gameplay because if you see it's coming into the bottom right hand of the screen, which is weird because some of the other games we reviewed, the gun comes into the center. You know what? It it does look like, I mean, it looks like the default position for gun positioning, it would be like a right-handed shooter, right. right? So the gun is typically off to the right-hand side. It's kind of a neat, quirky kind of thing to notice about a lot of these games. Yeah, Not yeah. a lot of left-handed shooters in, these right. games, in the war zone. And it, actually, that'd be better for you as a left-handed shooter. Because like I said, I'm fairly certain that this is flipped. This is a mirror image of uh, the way it is in real life. But otherwise, it looks it looks accurate. The stamped sheet metal. So for these ranges that we're doing right now, this is a great weapon system. Right, this is close quarters you know? battle. This is yeah. inside a building and stuff. Yeah. yeah, you can do one round or you 
could just hold it down and do multiple rounds. And you're shooting ball ammunition too. You're not shooting fancy hollow points. So you, uh. you, want, you want to put a few of it into whoever you're shooting at. So the recoil on this wasn't too crazy. You know, it had a reasonably slow rate of fire. It seems pretty accurate to me. I've only fired these once. It was a long time ago. It was fairly easy to control and it was surprisingly accurate even <laughs> with the offset sights, especially for that close up. You know, you're not taking incredibly far shots where having those offset sights are going to be an issue. It's always weird, like, why is the magazine on top? I mean, that was the design they came up with. The rounds eject onto the bottom. It worked, so, okay, cool. <laughs> Sten gun. Sten gun. Well, this is one of those ones with a classic look because it's got that side mm -hmm. feeding magazine. I've never fired one of these. Uh, yeah, you can. You can use a magwell for it. I mean, you can if you want, you know. Hold it up there. You can also hold in front of the front receiver, you know, the bottom receiver you can hold on over there. What's really cool about this though, is it is the quintessential like wartime submachine gun. The iteration we're seeing here, I believe is one of the last iterations of it. The first one was a little more complicated, took a little more time. They actually had wood stocks on them. Mm. And they realized that it wasn't, just wasn't necessary. You know, and plus we needed to pump these out quick. They were buying Thompson submachine guns for about 200 bucks a pop, which back then that's a lot of money. So they're like, we gotta, we gotta come up with this. And I'm glad we're talking about the Sten because in another video I was talking about the Sten and I said Sterling. Oh. And at the end of the video, which the Sterling, you know, Thank replaced you. this. And it was, because we we're talking about a, a gun, I think in Metro that had the side, you know, magazine. I'm like, oh, this reminds me. And I explained the Sten and then I said Sterling. But luckily everybody in the comment section, most people were pretty polite about it. They're like, I think he means the Sten. <laughs> so, and I did, and thank you. But yeah, so this is great. It's, it's a lovely, lovely weapon system. They used it up through the Korean War and yeah, eventually got replaced and it's not, you know, the most accurate. There's several different variants, but the main ones most people see are the wooden buttstock and that was at first. And then there was a wire buttstock huh. for a while. And I've seen several of those. This and one then, looks really stripped down in the buttstock yep, area. Almost looks like there's simple. no place to grip, but it's kind of like a, more like a rifle. Like the thumb hole stock. Thing. Yeah. It's, it's very, very simple. And you know, this is back when men were men and who cares about sharp edges. <laughs> you, just gotta, you know what I mean? Like, right, we're trying to win like, a world war here. It's an amazing piece of history. And if I were able to own a stand, this is the one that I would want. This is like its purest form. I love form. the sounds. It seems, you know, like I have obviously not fired any of these, but mm. boy, it sounds like they really do the research on, on the they sound do. of so the weapon firing. My friend Kenton Tucker, he owns um, the Big Sandy Machine Gun Range. And I got to work with him through Gunny Time TV and just, you know, we become friends. He's a wonderful man. He's the Jay Leno of gun. Right. He's a wonderful guy. One of the times I was there, uh, Call of Duty showed up and they just to record a bunch of sounds. I've worked with Call of Duty a lot, mostly on their commercials and stuff. And, nice, man. But uh, they do try to do the best job they can, which from what I understand some of their games though, they're cursed guns. <laughs> <laughs> but this one looks pretty solid. Love that they got a sight on there as well now. Yeah, like yeah. Side so mounted this, sight. So there's a ton of variants on here. And I think that's a realistic sight there. I, again, I'm not a World War II historian. I have fired this weapon before. And like generally, so in the film industry, what happens is they'll contact me. They'll say, hey, you know, we're shooting a Browning VAR. I'm like, oh, I love the Browning VAR. But then I'll do research. I'll look into how they effectively used it back then. Because like most of my experience and real world experience is modern firearms. And then we'll, I'll research that. And then we'll go on the set and train them with that. So that, that's my experience coming into this nice. sort of thing. So. Einhorn revolving shotgun. Okay, so this. This is not a military weapon. I haven't played the game, but from what I understand, I think there's a there's a female character who acquires this gun at the beginning for like a Lady German Death, officer. Maybe Lady Death, sniper, I think. Uh, uh, sure, Maybe. sure. You're more familiar with the game than I am, but I think she acquires this and then plays with it for a little bit. But from what I understand, it's available in the whole game. Would it be realistic to see these all over World War II Battlefield? No. I think there was maybe like 300 of these made. But oh, it's kind of a rare gun. I yeah, love the cylinder, yeah, no, this is like an cylinder magazine. Artesian. Yeah, it's it's very rare. It's, I mean, look at uh, scroll work. engraving. Yeah, I always say scroll work. <laughs> yeah, I was like trying to come <laughs> different. I mean, it's beautiful and it mechanical operation behind it. But like something like this would eventually get damaged in the battlefield. You get gunk and, and dirt in there. A little too nice yep. to be out. They already had pump shotguns from you know. I mean, the Germans were really upset when the Americans started using pump shotguns in World War One trench warfare. <laughs> so I mean, a pump gun would just make way more sense. So this is probably just like a, a, a civilian owned weapon that was picked up. If I had more space I'd own and more money, I'd own more firearms. And I would mostly do like <laughs> older stuff like this because it's just it's just fascinating how it works. And there's, I mean, look at the wood, look at the detail in the wood you right. know, that's been around, that's old wood. Way to go, Deb. And when you hold a weapon like that, you can feel it. You can feel the, the, the history, history. The way to history. You know, how many people touched this, like how much game was taken with that. For a realistic standpoint, you wouldn't see this all over the battlefield. This would be a personal weapon. And I do think it's really cool that they incorporate it into the game because it does fit the time frame. It is believable that somebody could have used this back mm. then, but I would not want to use that for very long in combat. Semi-auto? It looks 
pretty realistic. I mean, it doesn't look like he's doing any kind of action. No, no, triggers. maybe it is semi-automatic. Oh, I mean, yeah, that certainly looks like it. I don't see him pumping anything. It's probably semi-automatic, and I apologize for not knowing that at a time. Like I said, this is an oddball weapon system. It's just so beautiful. So yeah, you could use this to defend yourself. You could totally odd. use this to defend yourself. But would you want to use it in a bat? I'd want to use a pump gun. I'd want <laughs> if to you didn't have gun. anything else. Oh, yeah, for it's sure. beautiful, though. For sure. Love the reloading animation. And the sound effects, the moving of the cylinder. This is super cool. Oh, look, it's got like a pistol grip on the front. Like a angled forward grip, does it? Oh, man, yeah, Ooh. this is definitely semi. Look at how fast that shoots. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, it's gotta be a lot of fun to play with this in the game. There was a scene in Band of Brothers where, um, I think it was probably a Smith & Wesson double action pistol, I believe, where one of the soldiers got ma mailed a, a revolver in the mail from one of his dad's cop buddies. Oh. Like, holy cow. Like, so you'd see that stuff on the battlefield, but it wasn't common. Right, you it wasn't I mean? mass manufactured like the Sten gun or the Ogun. Or it wasn't manufactured for this. Mm. You know, like tons of cops carried that revolver mm. that was in there. All right, the SDG-44. I want to talk about this. This is the Storm Gewehr. This is what's really widely accepted as the first assault rifle. Keep in mind what I'm saying, assault rifle. That's a very specific term and it's a very military term. The only time I've ever heard that term in proper context is in serving in the military. And it means an intermediate caliber bullet. So generally like a lighter compared to your traditional battle round, a lighter intermediate caliber bullet and a select fire weapon. Select fire means you can do both semi-auto and fully auto. Fully auto could be burst or fully auto could just be like you hold down rock and roll till you run out. So that's what an assault rifle is. So a lot of people playing these video games or civilians, you hear the term assault weapon and that's just a made up term. So in the military, assault means something completely different than what it means in the civilian world. Assault in the civilian world is like, man, you know, give me your money. Uh, you're a jerk, you know. You know, when the Marines assault a beach, they don't run up and call it names and then like, you know, steal its wallet. They, they violently and effectively and quickly take the beach. And so this is an assault pack, right? And it looks just like a normal backpack and that's what it is. But in the military, so we have rucksack. You're Green Beret, you've carried some heavy rucks before. Yeah. You know, uh, I went to ranger school, carried some heavy rocks with light infantry, carried heavy rocks. And that's a big ass backpack that you can carry a lot of stuff. You would drop your rucksack and then this would be attached to it. And then you have an assault pack for running your missions. You keep extra ammo, maybe your night vision, extra medical, or you'd put like intel that you'd find other things. So this is for light, quick movements. And what this rifle was used for, instead of a traditional battle rifle, it was used to more effectively take a village, take a town to assault forward. Hitler named it the Stormgewehr, the storm rifle, the assault rifle the same reason that politicians or media say assault weapon because it strikes fear because it's, it's a very scary sounding weapon and it sounds intimidating and it is this is a very effective rifle there were a couple before select fire intermediate caliber rounds i think we're going to talk about it in this game there was a russian rifle that off the top of my head i don't remember when you see that but this is more considered like the granddaddy of all of them you have the browning bar and they made a lighter version called the colt monitor which is a sexy sexy gun a lot of fbi and law enforcement had that because of the roaring 20s and fighting mm -hmm. gangsters mm -hmm. Bonnie and Clyde would F people up. But that was more like a battle rifle round. This is considered the first assault rifle. Now an M4 is an assault rifle. Whether it's three round burst, which on an M4 platform is dumb, or full auto, that's an assault rifle. Your standard AR-15, while there really isn't any main difference between the two, except for full auto, that's just a semi-automatic rifle. And people will call them assault rifles, they're not. An assault rifle has to be select fire. So I'm really glad we're talking about this, just because I wanted to throw that information out there. Assault weapon, made up term, used to uh, just kind of confuse people maybe cause a little fear. Assault rifle, a select fire intermediate caliber rifle. This actually heavily influenced the later AK-47, AKM. I was gonna say, if it was something that I could compare it to, but <laughs> actually the pistol grip and the trigger, that, that receiver, it almost looks like a 240 or something It does, like it's that, a very you know? similar angle and just like the grip itself looks like on the 240, which is ironic because that's a very late entry in history. They're just amazing rifles. There's stories about like US soldiers picking them up and using them. It gave so much more capability because your average the average German soldier was carrying a uh, K98 Mauser, which is a bolt action gun, which is a great gun, but like this was just, as far as capabilities, was just above and beyond. Looks like a button magazine release. Right yep, there. yep. I don't believe, yeah, yeah, it's right there is the mag release and that looks pretty good. The sights look fairly accurate. If you notice, they're kind of like an AK sight where it's forward of the receiver, mm. right? You know, it's forward of that charging handle and everything. These were just impressive, impressive weapon system and it led to the development of the AK series rifles, the M4s, you know, 
the G3s. Like everybody kind of was like, this is a great idea. Let's continue on. And it's important to notice, like I mentioned G3, like the Spanish set me, those are bigger rounds. Like the AK-47, AKM, AK-74, although they use two different rounds, those are more intermediate caliber. A battle rifle for Russians would be like 762 by 5 r Well, I think this actually shot 7 by 9 2 Yeah, so it's a 30 caliber bullet. It's, it's a larger bullet. Though. This was it. Now, this was used in World War II or this is something that kind of came before World War II? Maybe no, this was developed the during, this, this, they started using it during World War II. Okay, all right. This is not beforehand. No. I've always wanted to go to Austria, especially after seeing Band of Brothers, but apparently there's a Meixner Manor in Austria. No way. With my family's coat of arms cool. and everything. Look yeah, it up, so. editors, Meixner Manor, yeah, Austria. Look it, look it up. So it's a cool coat of arms too. It's, it's neat. Automaton. I know, it sounds like something off of Futurama. Well, yeah, like a robot, auto or, or automatic like an NPC or automaton. Or a, yeah. or a normie. Normie. <laughs> an automaton. automaton. Ooh, look at that. Okay, so this is perfect. This is a perfect lineup right after the STG 44. So some people consider this to be an assault rifle. This doesn't get as much credit. They, it was only available, I think at first it was around the 20s, and then they stopped issuing it, and they reissued it later on during the Second World War, but it was later replaced with other guns because this thing would overheat. That was the main issue huh. with it. After 300 rounds of sustained fire it was basically inoperable i love the uh look at the bus tag it looks like almost like it's something for a sling like a sling loop there oh yeah 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 you got a sling loop there and you know this is like a thumb hole butt stock you can kind of see the uh sks come hmm. on this a little bit you know which that wasn't magazine fed that was strip -a standard was that, a suppressor is that a suppressor on the front it looks like a suppressor i don't i don't know i don't know i don't want to i don't want to sure know, it's not like i don't talking about i'll do that you can attack me <laughs> sure i mean it was fairly effective for you know small skirmishes and it was brand new you know what I mean? Like most Russians had Mosin the guns. I've always called them Mosins. And everybody should own a Mosin. If you're a gun guy, you should definitely have a Mosin at some point. Okay, so you see that big window up there? That's for range. And if it's a 760 by 54, you're gonna be able to reach out and touch someone. This is actually, I think it could be the first select fire rifle. Huh. You know, so many that. weapons that we've seen don't have that kind of built in that front post. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's, of, that's a yeah. newer thing. But you know, a lot of GIs grip. would modify their weapons to put a front grip on it yeah. sometimes. Or they'd even like, if it didn't have a pistol grip on the back, sometimes they would just jury rig it. There was a lot of that done. You know, it's, it's funny how that looks like a M4. I think they're doing, playing a little fast and loose with history with a lot of these sites. Because they, they gotta get, people wanna get a sight on there. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I definitely don't recognize that. I mean, this thing's cool. I've never fired one of these. I would love to at some point. I know that there's a reason they weren't in service very long. During World War II, they just pumped them out. Well, they reissued them. I don't even think they made, I don't, I'm not even sure if they made more of them. Huh. So, but uh, you know, they, they used what they had until they came up with something better. All right, the Browning BAR. This is one of my favorites. It's so recognizable, you know. You've seen this, and I feel like you've seen this like Band of Brothers or you know Saving Private Ryan. It was heavily used in World War One and near the end of World War Two. So this is a John Moses Browning. Patron saint of you know gun designs, awesome dude. When he designed this. They needed another light machine gun that was like man portable. This kind of fit the bill. It did okay for World War One. It was still kind of rough, and it went through a bunch of iterations. Sometimes you have something that's great in both sides, you know. Mm -hmm. This was kind of lacking in both sides, both as a light machine gun and as like a DMR rifle. Like I carried the saw forever, and that's what filled this role. But they, they were still figuring stuff out mm. back then, you know what I mean? So like a saw is much better for this type of thing. But I mean, they also didn't have that technology then. The gangsters love this. The gangsters absolutely <laughs> love this. And two of the most famous, which I'm sure our viewers will recognize, Bonnie and Clyde. Oh. Clyde would love the Brownie BAR and they owned several and would modify them and they ah. would just cops. Not great, but you know, that's that's what happened. And he would actually teach Bonnie, his girlfriend or fiance, how to use it. She wasn't very big, she was tiny, and she would just mess people up with the Browning <laughs> PAR. And they later came out with one that I want to get my hands on at some point called the Colt Monitor. I think they cut several pounds off of it. They had a pistol grip underneath instead of the traditional rifle mm -hmm. stock, and uh, it had a shortened barrel, and I think it had cooling rings on it. It had this it had this compensator on it. But the compensator, it kind of helped. It wasn't that great. They put it on some of these later on, but it would just kick up so much dust and everything when shooting the prone, it was like hit or miss. The it's, sound, the look, yeah. the feel of it. How do you like that? Oh, uh, it feels look. great. So right now they're shooting on low fire. I fired, I fired a few of these on both. Generally has two settings: high speed and low speed. Huh. And on low speed, the rate of fire is much slower, but it's much more controllable. Mm. This was designed to be hip fired. Mm. That was one of the things which I'm not a fan of that. And you know, we look back like shooting and the techniques behind it have improved greatly. And you know, we have these ideas and we build upon those ideas. I can shoulder fire this. 
this, but I'm also a big guy. So, and one of the modifications for a lot of guys is they would take the front bipods off because it was just extra weight. And, mm. You know, they would either hip fire it, rock it through, or shoulder fire it. I think guys had a love hate relationship with it. The guys that really liked it really liked it. But like I said, it wasn't really the best light machine gun, and it was it was too heavy to be like a designated marksman rifle. Mm. When you go to war, you use what you have. Sure. You know what I mean? Like it'd be great to have the best of everything, but sometimes it just can't happen. Well, there's a lot of you know? advancements in war. Sometimes they really learn a lot of lessons in wartime. That silly really putty. Cause big, yeah. <laughs> you know about silly putty? So they were trying to develop some type of rubber for I think either the Navy or the Army, and they're like, what is this chemical compound? Oh my oh. God. Hey, it, uh, well, I don't know if this is useful, but maybe we I could sell take it as a toy. take prints off of my newspaper. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, the DP-20, I think this is a Soviet aircraft gun. Oh, oh yeah. look at that pie yeah, plate magazine. Yeah. yeah, it is. So this was used um, as aircraft got faster. It wasn't as effective because I think it only had like a 550 rate of fire. Those magazines are iconic. Um, you see them on a lot of coaxial guns in World War One for, hmm. for the biplanes. Oh, OK. And, oh, uh, yeah. Very kind of iconic imagery. Yeah. 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 And so this was, I think, used in both World War One and World War Two. I think this is Soviet shoots a 762 by 54. Yeah, I think it does. Yep. And so this would be on uh, tank turrets and this would be on you know whatever Soviet version of Jeeps or trucks would be, and it was a defensive gun on some of the earlier planes. But it was pretty reliable. It was a pretty reliable gun. Fast rate of fire. It looks super accurate. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a mid rate of fire. I mean, from everything I've read, it's it's like around five to six hundred rounds per minute. But uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. You know, let me know if I'm wrong. Which that seems pretty slow for aircraft guns, but aircraft at first didn't go very fast. See how that's moving around there? That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I love no great it's animation so with the uh, magazine. I wish I could describe to all your viewers how to load one of those. I've never loaded a disc magazine like that before. Yeah. I can't wait to get my hands on one. If you Pretty know, heavy. You want me to shoot it? Maybe yeah. Call. Yeah, 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 this would be heavy. Like this was mostly a mounted weapon system. I'm sure they came with bipods. I know they came, I know you could get them with bipods so you could run through kind of like a Browning automatic rifle. This was often mounted on vehicles. So, and it's a very effective round that it's shooting. It's. I wouldn't want to get hit with it. So, I want to get hit with like 30, 35 rounds, well, how many rounds is it? 63. Well, I don't know. The, the game may be taking a few. Right, 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 right. Like I said, I wish I wish I could just rattle off these numbers like Ian from Forgotten Weapons. But <laughs> my career is focused a little differently than his. And I'm <laughs> thankful that he exists. And yeah, he can answer these questions for him. Going in an airstrike. I mean, if you had to use this in a room like that, I would. I use my saw for like room clearing, you know, like I've shoulder fired a 240 before, which is not fun. I mean, it's kind of fun, but it's not. All right, the MG42. So my favorite, one of my favorite machine guns of all time is the MG34. Okay. This replaced the MG34. Okay. It's just much more effective. It's super reliable. Hitler's buzzsaw. Oh, like it had okay. a very distinct sound. It struck fear to the heart of GIs and doughboys, but every time they're like, oh, they're shooting that thing at us. Such a high, like a thousand rounds per minute, 1100, oh I think a thousand rounds per minute. Wow. Insane rate of fire. This Ooh. heavily influenced a lot of machine gun design. I mean, I'm seeing machine. like maybe shadows of like the M60. M60. Yeah. Okay. Which I fired my first M60 recently. I fired oh, really? a lot of 240s and saws, but like I remember in like 2004, we'd roll up on some National Guard units, which it wasn't a National Guard unit. We were light infantry and had all the modern stuff at the time, anyways. And there would be some older reserve units and a couple of National Guard units that still had M60s and they were like civil affairs or like, you know, they weren't <laughs> combat units. They had 60s on their Humvees. I was like, wow. Wow, that's a heavy duty charging handle, right? There. I've never fired this thing with one of those drums on the side right there. This all looks fairly real to me. You know, this would allow you to, to move with it a lot quicker. And then you probably have like, you know, either ammo cans or you'd have rounds draped over you. You mm. definitely have an egg. But look at that rate of fire. Woo! Just look at that. It's it's so devastating. Beauty. Love it. Such a Great animations. Movie. I love the reloading animations, real kind of detail and mm -hmm. stuff. It looks so German too. Actually, if you're an old school Star Wars guy, which you know I am. Expanded universe in the original trilogies, right. two Ewok movies count. But there's somebody holding one, right? Yeah, yeah. So Star this droid, IG-88, which he's carrying a, uh, like a modified for the sci-fi world. Oh, okay. Believe in MG-42. Yes. Cool, cool. So go back, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, the scene where with all the bounty hunters up on the bridge. Where yeah, Darth we don't Vader's need that scum. Back. Yeah. So th this looks cool. This looks cool. Um, I think it'd be a lot more difficult to, to shoulder fire than what they're showing in the game, but sure. they're getting the rate of fire down. This thing was just so devastating, man. That makes me happy. Like an EOTech on there. Don't get in front of him. <laughs> yeah, this thing was just devastating, man. I, I've said that several times now, but it's such a fine piece of what. Some German stuff is overcomplicated, but this was very reliable. Shoot those drugs up, just stick them into your vein. Is that what that is? Like yeah, a, just little a little adrenaline? Little shot of adrenaline, maybe morphine. Jesus. Yeah, barrel's getting hot. Oh, uh, only, only to get taken out in the end. Yeah, right. 
just in time to move on. Well, I mean, like the machine gunner is usually like they said that to me every time. Like you're the guy they're gonna shoot at first. You know? You're the most casually yeah. producing weapon out there. Yeah. Hell's yes, I am. Even without the machine gun. That's right. <laughs> Three line the rifle. You know what's funny is I've never heard it called that before, which is kind of dumb because that's actually what it's called. But we've always called it the Mosin. Oh, this is what you were talking about. Everybody yes. should own a Mosin. Yep, yep. And everybody should have a Mosin. But the three line, I believe, refers to it being a 30 caliber rifle. And this shoots that big ass. 762 by 54R. Once I just picked up some 762 rounds and I wasn't looking, and I'm like, I was trying to get 762 NATO, and I'm like, wait a minute. And I looked at like heart, and I had, you know, three boxes of 762 NATO and then two of 5R. I'm like, this, I don't have one of these. Looks like I'm gonna have to get a new gun. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get another gun. But yeah, like I said, this is why you get level four plates for your plate carrier. The armor piercing 762 by 5R round is still used by Russian forces today in their sniper rifles and DMR rifles. It's a devastating round, it's been around forever. And this rifle is just just super reliable, super accurate. This looks all correct to me as someone that's not necessarily an expert on World War II firearms. Like the individual the rounds line. reloading. Did yep. you have like a strip? I believe this also, you know, you could load it with a stripper clip as well. It looks like- Most the, of these type of rifles you could do that with. So. Looks like uh, the scope might be getting in the way. Yeah, 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 yeah that, could, but that could be very well hit. Maybe that's just for animation purposes. And, a lot and of the times, scope looks accurate, you were saying. I mean, a lot of times in these games, they try to balance them out. You know, there's, right, there's right. power, there's the hand and then there's things like the reload time. Maybe you have a really powerful weapon, but they kind of handicap you just a little bit by making you reload it one at a time. And it's gonna Which makes it more interesting. Sure. There's a new challenge. Like nobody wants to do something that's easy. Yeah. You know, like I remember the original Doom and my cousin would put it on God mode for me. Uh, and that was fun. But it was fun for like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, give me a challenge. No again. challenge. Good. There's a lot. It's, it's now that, that round piece in the back, I think that should be moving full. I think that like when he pulls it back, I think it sits back. Yep. You see that, that round piece right there? I think yeah. it sits back and then when he pulls the trigger, it moves forward, if I'm mistaken. Is that the bolt carrier or something like is that? Yeah, that, that, the, the whole thing is the bolt, but okay. I, I think that part sticks out and then when you pull the trigger, it moves forward. Okay. Maybe I'm mistaken. Again, like, you know, just brutalize me in the comments. Just go to town. Kill, 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 kill. Type 99, the Ariska. So some Japanese weapons were complicated and fragile and kind of goofy looking, and some of them were pretty reliable and durable, and this is one of the better Japanese bolt action rifles. They had extra arms growing out, little umbrellas. It was really weird, those Japanese. <laughs> the tentacles. <laughs> tentacles, yeah, well, we that, was, that was later, later. Japanese weapons, yeah, line. weird. This was a great battle rifle. I would love to own one. Looks yeah. like there's an offset scope. It does have iron sights on it as well, and the iron sights are fairly accurate. So I think you could run this fairly quickly. And look at like, like the detail on this. Yeah. It's a simple Even the reticle. knurling around the scope. Didn't have anything and stuff super like that. fancy yet. Yeah. Or was it fancy reticles weren't really commonplace yet? And yeah, and it's offset so that way, you know, the ejection and everything isn't getting in the way. So Jeff Cooper, he was this prolific uh, firearms trainer and kind of, you could say, designer a little bit. He's someone that really moved forward a lot of firearms training. He developed this thing called the Scout Rifle, which we talked about in a previous video. And it could have used a caliber similar to this. Just an intermediate caliber, well, slightly heavier caliber, like a battle rifle caliber, like 7 6 2 you know, or something, or 8 million. And they had, uh, the scope was up forward. And so the M1A, you can get two different versions or like the M14, you can do two different things. You can get a scout scope, which a scout scope has much longer eye relief. So you can put it forward of the action. Ah. And that's more for like urban combat type thing. But then they had other versions where it was over the top of the action, but then you couldn't do some of the remedial action. Oh, interesting. So their yeah. solution here is to be offset. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the placement of the scope. You're saying that if the scope is further away from where you're set with the eye, so that can be- Right, so certain like, rifles. Certain like, different purposes. Springfield, the Springfield M1A is a perfect modern example. It's like a semi-auto version of the M14. Okay. And you can get a scope that's called the Scout Scope. It has much longer eye relief. So with every optic, even with the variable power ones, you have to adjust <laughs> your, you know, your eye relief. So with a Scout Scope, you put it up and your, your cheek weld's here. Here's the action and the scope is up here. Okay. It allows you to see through it because a lot of optics, a lot of powered optics, if you're too far away, you can't see. Mm. If you're too close, can't see. It has to be the right eye relief, and those are known as scout scopes mm -hmm. so for the scout rifle. And they work really well on M14, M1, M1 Garand or Garand, whichever you prefer to call it. They're out there, that's just, that's just a thing. And instead of doing something like that, which I don't even know if those existed at that point, they decided to have it offset. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Oh, the fun the weapon. Elon Musk was like, we wanted to make something that wasn't useful. 
And uh, we decided to make a three inch lower and we never do it again. But that was it. <laughs> yep, it was good. And we sold all of them. <laughs> I love the simple the pipe at the end. There's not a lot of, there's not a fancy grip. It looks like he's even got like gloves on. So I'm gonna get a little dark here, but these were super effective for what they were used for. It was mostly used for getting guys out of pillboxes. Uh, I can see that. They're dug in, just throw yep. a bunch of flames in there. And, yep. uh, and then the thing is, it's not just flame. No? Like you get that stuff on you, you keep burning. Uh, you know what I mean? Because it's gelled fuel. So I don't remember exactly when napalm was invented. I think this is before that, but it was like this like gelled gasoline almost. And again, you know, comment, comment away. I'll find the comment and like it and say, hey, that was a good burn. Uh, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, 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 appreciate it. Uh, uh, uh. Burn. But uh, yeah, man, it was not fun. Not fun to do this. And you can smell it too. You know what I mean? You can smell Ugh. the guys that you're burning. I can and honestly. I know I'm taking some of the fun out of this, but. Oh, I can honestly oh. say that. Oh, I, man. He's yeah, see, his torso. Off. I could just. Th I, I think to myself, I would do not want to be the guy with the flamethrower on his back. Well, yeah. You Generally, the guy with the flamethrower had a couple guys guarding him and protecting him and uh, rolling through them. You weren't so by yourself just running around. Yeah. Because you get shot in the back and you're done. Yeah, you're I think done, there's man. a great shot of Saving Private Ryan illustrating that perfectly. Yep. So this was a very specific weapon generally used for you know people in caves people in armored positions this isn't something you'd normally be assaulting a village with yeah you know what i mean now i don't know if you know much about you know the barrel or the composition of the fuel and stuff like that it looks like it's got a pretty strong stream before it starts to yeah dissipate. so they can go away so there's a couple different types of flamethrowers i think the one uh, that the boring company made elon musk it literally was just like in order to be qualified as a flamethrower versus a torch there has to be a certain number of feet oh uh, that but, it travels yeah but the World War II ones, guys, I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you the exact yardage. Let us know in <laughs> the comments. It goes pretty far. It goes pretty far. Pretty deep far. Yeah, pretty they, quacking far. The fuel is propulsed out of there pretty strong. It's got pretty high pressure. And of course it has to because you don't want that flame to like ride back up. And right. I, I might have or might not have made a couple flamethrowers out of super soakers when I was a kid. Uh, and then I had one that was like an off-brand super soaker. It was like a two-gallon backpack. It was one of those you go... What do you, do you mean you just like fill it up with I like mean, gasoline? I mean, I might have like... tried to figure out how to make, you know, fluid maybe and allegedly might have put like a map gas torch duct tape to the front of it. Yeah, just... allegedly. Allegedly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, was totally never happened in real life. We just thought Absolutely about it not, a lot. you know. So, so you can make them. It's, it's super dangerous. Yes, very dangerous. Yeah. Don't allegedly don't, try this Don't at allegedly home. try it. Allegedly. Just bubble wrap yourself in your house and don't come out. Backscatter. Wow, awesome stuff from Call of Duty Vanguard. A lot of old weapons. I like seeing these old timey World War II era type weapons. Me too, I had a lot of fun watching that footage. This is a game that I would definitely check out. Other than the Owen with the sights kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, please somebody say in the comments. That I'm correct her. But I think they're on the other side, but otherwise everything looked pretty accurate. It would have been cool to see the various iterations of the Sten, you yeah. know, with the wood stock and the wire, you know, the bent wire stock and that. I love, love, love World War II era weapons. Just yeah. the engineering and the, the, the purple that went into them and there's so many reasons why they are the way they are it's not just like hey, this works really well well this works really well and it's cheap and uh we can pump and it quick out. you have to pump you know what out. i mean yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of factors into there and that's something a lot of people don't realize in the military i mean working in green berets i get a little bit more special equipment but it also depends upon what team you're on right? sure and so yeah like, what your mission is yeah and so like sometimes you get super specialized stuff but often a lot of it is just like this is durable but it's, it's just two big pockets you know what i mean my assault pack <laughs> sure. you know what i brought in to explain the variations weapon. on a theme yeah it's just the lowest bidder is it durable? It doesn't have to be the best. You have to be the best. Yes. You are the best. You're the best. Oh, you're the best no, around. You're the best. Nothing's ever going to be the best you in down. town. You're the best around, all around. <laughs> and you're the best, folks. You guys are the best. We really appreciate you joining us for this episode of Total Recoil. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and check out Gameology's Facebook and YouTube page. If you want to hang out with me a little bit more, we have a brand new channel coming out called Shift Fire. Myself and Cameron Fath get into all things military culture. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Also, check out the Pop Culture Field Manual podcast. And you can go to twitch.tv slash myhappyself if you want to hang out with me live. Paul, where can people get a hold of you? If you'd like to get a hold of me, check me out on Instagram at nav11b, M-A-V-1-1-B, or check out my new podcast, Thunderpunk Radio, which should be available on most, if not all, streaming platforms and social media platforms. Namaste. Adios. Oh, Theater Zane. Oh, oh Theater Zane. Our Theater oh, Zane. All right. Feel like this is all right. Ah! Okay. I'm a prima donna now. Everything has to be about me. If you want to get a hold of me, ah, uh, ah, uh, no. Mm -hmm. You, Paul. Mm -hmm.